Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace <clears throat> for our discussion, The World Economy on a Precipice. My name is Sandra Pulaski. I head the Trade, Equity, and Development Program here at Carnegie, and I will be the moderator today. <clears throat> As we're all aware, the world economy is in the grip of a crisis which has contributed to a severe contraction of production and of trade <clears throat> that has led to uh, layoffs and unemployment, which has led to further reduction in demand, further reductions in trade and production. <clears throat> My colleague, Uri Dadouche, who recently joined the Carnegie Endowment to head a new program here at Carnegie on the international economy, has organized this panel um, of experts and leaders <clears throat> to examine the outlook for the world economy, for developed and developing country markets, and the prospects for maintaining an open global trading system. Let me briefly introduce our panel. You have longer biographies in your material, so I will, I will be very brief here. Uh, we will hear first from uh, Jorg de Cresson, who heads the World Economic Studies Division in the Research Department of the IMF and coordinates the production of the IMF's World Economic Outlook. A German national, he joined the IMF after he obtained his PhD from Harvard University in 1993. <clears throat> Next, we will have a presentation by Hans Timmer, the lead economist in the World Bank's Development Prospects Group and manager of the Global Trends Team, which is responsible for the bank's annual publications, Global Economic Prospects, and Global Development Finance. Following Hans, we will hear the views of Ambassador John Bruton, the ambassador to the United States of the European Union Commission. The ambassador was formerly Prime Minister of Ireland, in that capacity, he helped transform the Irish economy into the Celtic Tiger, one of the fastest growing economies in the world, and advanced the Northern Irish peace process. Before that, he held several ministerial positions in the Irish government, <clears throat> including finance, industry, and trade. Finally, we will hear from my colleague, Uri Dadouche, who is a senior associate and the director in the Carnegie's new international economics program, which will focus on trends in the global economy and the global financial crisis. A French citizen, Uri previously served as the World Bank's Director of International Trade for six years, and before that as Director of Economic Policy for the bank. Let me call on Mr. de Cresson to begin. Thank you very much for this introduction, and thank you. Um, from uh, the perspective of the advanced economies, so I'm proposing to talk to you about uh, how we see the prospects for advanced economies uh, and where we see the policy priorities at the current juncture. So let's start first with some data. What you see in this chart is uh, industrial production and, and merchandise exports. This is at the global level. And what you remark there at the far right uh, of the chart is that both are really taking a fall off the cliff for the moment. Um, I should point out that the decline in merchandise export and industrial production is particularly deep in the advanced economies. So a large part of this fall of the cliff is actually taking place in advanced economies. And if you dig a little deeper, uh, a lot of it, a good part of it, can be explained by the sharp decline in the demand for consumer durables in the advanced economies, of which you know car, cars are perhaps the, the, best, the best example. So it's really a very large uh, decline in trade. I'm sure that my colleague from the World Bank will, will comment further on this, also from the perspective of the emerging economies. It is a, a, an event that, that perhaps uh, if, if, you, if you try to dig in, in history, you would have to go back to the early 1980s to find something that is similar but, but not, as, not quite as deep as what we're seeing right now. So um, what we are expecting is that the world economy will, uh, that real GDP at the global level will contract in 2009. Uh, a contraction uh, would be a first uh, since uh, World War II. Uh, here I want to focus on the advanced economies, which uh, you see in the red line. Um, you see here a, a chart on real GDP growth that goes back all the way to the 1970s. And if you focus on the right end of the chart, right, you see that we are in territory that we haven't been not even nearly close to. Uh, over the last 30 years, and it's also the largest decline since, since World War II in the, in the advanced economies. We're expecting growth, uh, well, we're expecting a contraction of about, of over 3% in 2009 in output in the advanced economies. And then for 2010, we expect uh, um, stagnation. So it's pretty uh, deep, um, deep recession. Um, this chart here, 
I'll show you a little more country detail. What you see here is that for all, for all the major areas in the advanced economies, the U.S., the Euro area, and Japan, we, we see large contractions uh, in 2009 by about 2.5% in the U.S., about 3% in the Euro area, and by about 6% uh, in, in Japan. Then if you look at 2010, you basically see that we are projecting at the moment uh, broadly zero growth for real GDP. Um, I should stress that all of these, uh, these uh, projections are not yet final. Um, our final uh, WIO forecast will be made published on, on April 22nd. And uh, more likely than not, uh, the final numbers will be lower uh, rather than higher than the, num the ones that I'm presenting to you right here. Uh, this is illustrated by the way we see risks distributed around our forecast. This is our first take at, at an assessment of the, of, the, of the likely distribution of growth forecasts. The dark blue shaded center of the graph kind of shows you where we expect world growth to be in 2009, uh, you know, right around uh, a half percent to, to minus one percent. And then we expect world growth in 2010 to be in a, in a range between you know, one and a half and, and two and a half percent. But then when you start, if you want to be, become more confident about what you're forecasting, you would have to widen that interval because the further out you go, the less confident we are about our forecast. And I expect that once we have refined this, this analysis and come up with the final numbers, the fan chart will be looking even wider, meaning the, 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 the risks around our forecasts are much wider, and they will remain tilted to the downside, which is what they are already here, very clearly so in, in 2009. So what are the assumptions behind the recovery in 2010? I mean, it's not really a recovery in a sense because, you know, the, the growth rates will be still modest. On an, average annual, on an annual average basis, there will be around zero uh, for 2010. On a Q4, Q4 basis, which is another way of looking at it, they'll be, they'll be slightly positive. So what are the assumptions, uh, you know, in terms of us uh, getting from, from contractions to, to, small, to small growth in 2010? Well, first, there's... Uh, we are assuming that uh, the monetary easing that has taken place uh, will feed through to the, to the economy and offer support to activity. There has also been significant fiscal stimulus. And moreover, we are also assuming that financial conditions begin to improve based on a stabilization uh, in the U.S. housing market. Now let's go over these uh, various points in, in, in some depth. First, as you can see from this chart here, which shows you policy rates, and I'd like you to focus on the red, the yellow, and, and the green uh, lines, which are for the United States, the Euro area, and Japan, respectively. What you see is that uh, in, in, in these three major areas, uh, policy, well, in the policymakers have kept either rates very low or, and cut them slightly further, or have cut them quite considerably from, from high levels. Like the United States, we're coming from levels of near 6% to close to zero. In Japan, we were barely above zero, and now again closer to zero. And in the Euro area, we've come from rates of around 4.5%, to 1.5% uh, right now, and, and, and markets are expecting uh, further cuts uh, by the ECB. But that's not all. What these uh, central banks have also done is they have loosened collateral requirements. You're getting money more readily from them. Um, they have lengthened maturity, meaning banks uh, can obtain money for longer from, uh, from the central banks. Uh, and, they, and some of them have also intervened directly in, in asset markets, I mean, purchasing assets in order to support prices and getting uh, credit to flow again. Similarly, uh, fiscal policy is uh, quite supportive of activity. What you're seeing here is a focus on the red line, which is for advanced economies. Uh, these economies posted uh, fiscal balances that were in deficit uh, of around, you know, just a little bit less than 2% of GDP in 2006 and 2007. And as a result of fiscal stimulus, as well as the operation of automatic stabilizers, which basically is about tax revenues declining as economic activity decline, declines. On account of these two, um, fiscal balances will deteriorate to around uh, deficits of 8% of GDP in 2009 and, and at this stage still recover modestly uh, in 2010. I'll talk about that later. But the bottom line is that fiscal policy has been quite accommodative uh, and that this should be supporting activity and, and a recovery. So what more needs to be done? Well, first, uh, with respect to macroeconomic uh, policies, it's, uh, it's basically in, in some ways more of the same, meaning uh, monetary policy will continue to have to remain 
easy, uh, can be eased further in some areas, uh, such as, uh, as in the UA area, by cutting interest rates, but then also um, expand on, on unconventional measures uh, to, support, uh, to support activity. Again, the Fed has pretty much uh, pulled all the stops. The latest one was to uh, purchase Treasury bills. Uh, the Bank of England is doing the same thing. Uh, the Bank of Japan is intervening in, in, uh, in equity markets, and uh, the European Central Bank is basically um, further uh, uh, providing, is, is providing funding at, at even longer maturities than it has uh, so far and, and, and engaging in other special operations in order to affect uh, uh, credit markets uh, beyond the usual channel, which is via interest rates. Um, the second point is uh, fiscal policy. Fiscal policies will need to remain um, accommodative. I mean, at this stage, as you had seen in the previous chart, there's a little bit of a pullback in 2010, um, and, and we believe that it, it, in 2010, in advanced economies, there, there is a case to implement further measures uh, to, uh, ease fiscal, uh, to ease fiscal policy. So additional stimulus is probably required in 2010. Uh, it would be a mistake to withdraw uh, stimulus uh, at that stage when the economy is likely not to be on a solid path to, path to recovery. So further stimulus will be needed in advanced economies. And then the final point, which is the sine qua non, uh, policies need to be uh, implemented to, to heal the financial sector. Uh, and I will get back to these in the, in the next few slides. But before that, I just wanted to, to sh share with you a little bit of analysis that we have done on, on uh, recessions. Uh, we've basically looked at, at, at uh, a large number of recessions in advanced economies since the 1960s and distinguished between two types of recessions, those that were caused by a financial crisis and those that were, you know, uh, or the average run-of-the-mill recession, those that were not necessarily caused by a financial crisis. So what I'm showing to you here is, you know, the probability that a, that a recession survives uh, depending on its characteristics. The red line shows it to you for the full sample, right? So basically uh, what the, the red line shows to you, this, the probability of survival is near zero after six quarters. So, you know, uh, if you're really unlucky with, a, with your standard recession, you know, if you're really unlucky, then, you know, it takes you six quarters to get out of it. Now, if you look at the yellow line, which, which plots uh, uh, the same thing, but for recessions that were preceded or caused by a financial crisis as, as identified in the literature, you can see that it takes you way longer to get out of it, to be sure to have gotten out of it. Um, so what, what did we then do? We then thought, like, okay, fine, we can decompose the financial crisis-driven recessions into those where there's been a strong fiscal or strong monetary policy response, right, and see what happens to the probability of survival under these circumstances. And that's illustrated by, by the blue and by the green uh, uh, lines, which are in between, uh, and, that show, and, and they basically show you that the probability of survival of, of a financial crisis-driven recession diminishes quite appreciably you know, on the order of 20% at any point in time if you have a strong macroeconomic policy response in place. Now, let me again get back to the key um, policy, channel, uh, policy challenge, which is to restore the financial sector to health. What we have been uh, pushing for is a three-pronged approach consisting of generous provision of liquidity to banks, uh, which uh, the central banks everywhere have been doing and are continuing to do so, dealing with solvency, which is basically providing um, inst financial institutions, banks uh, that um, have run out of capital or have capital below, uh, below the, the levels that markets are expecting, providing them with, with additional capital in order for them to again be able to, to operate on a solid footing and not having to cut back credit uh, in line with the reduction in, in capital that they are suffering because of the losses on toxic and other assets. And the final point, the third point, is dealing with the bad assets, that is uh, uh, removing these bad assets from uh, the, the balance sheets of, of the banks. And that's perhaps the, the area where least progress has been made. Um, the Fed has just uh, um, in the last couple of days announced a new initiative uh, to uh, to make more progress on this front, and, and uh, we, we, we very much welcome this initiative. But, uh, you know, at, we, what we think is basically that this initiative will, will certainly create demand for, for bad assets. The question is still whether banks will be ready to supply um, these assets at, at lower prices or whether they not rather hold on to them on maturity and, and value them at, at, at prices that are higher than what is currently uh, being offered in, in the marketplace. Uh, that is something that remains to be seen. But... Uh, 
the key, I mean, here I'm also coming to the key risk in terms of our forecast. I said the risks were on the downside, and, and what is perhaps the most important downside risk? It is that the political economy is, is, turning, very, is, is, is turning increasingly less favorable to financial sector restructuring. Um, what is clear is that significant amounts of public funds all over the world, uh, sorry, all over the advanced economies, many advanced economies, will be needed in order to uh, uh, restore uh, banks to health. Uh, and the, the support in the broad population for this uh, currently um, is not very strong. And if it's not strong, then that will hold up uh, the recapitalization. And the longer recapitalization is being held up, the more credit will be cut back by the banks. And the more credit is being cut back, the more activities will suffer. The more activity suffers, the more asset prices will go down. And so you have a vicious circle until you find some, some bottom that, that could take place. So... Um, just this is the last slide on, on the medium run challenges. I mean, what kind of lessons are we drawing from the crisis? Um, let me just point out a few of them. It's clear that we need to broaden the perimeter of, of financial regulation. Um, you know, it cannot only cover banks. It also has to cover investment banks. It cannot only um, cover banks. It also has to cover special purpose vehicles and, and, other, uh, and other institutions. Um, we also need to make an effort to move over-the-counter trading uh, onto organized markets, which will make uh, the flows more transparent and uh, give people a clearer appreciation of the risk. And then perhaps the biggest challenge is, is to make uh, monetary policy you know, more, uh, I mean, is, is to move monetary policy in, in, in a direction where it takes account of financial sector risks and to move financial sector policy into a direction where it uh, takes account of, macro, of the macroeconomic cycle. Um, uh, this is a very complex uh, field. It sounds simple, but uh, the reason it hasn't been done is because it's so complex, and we can talk about that later maybe in the questions and answers. And the final point we are pushing very strongly is there needs to be more coordination. If you have uh, a world where everything is financially so connected as it is right now, then countries that uh, implement policies to, to address their financial sector challenges will need to bear into in mind the repercussions of their policies on other countries. So give me a, uh, let me give you an example. A country um, imposes, uh, you know, gives guarantees to, to, to its banks uh, uh, in its territory. Well, this will have immediate consequences because then people in other countries remove their assets uh, to the banks in this country that is offering guarantees. And so you will be affecting other countries in the process. And most often the countries that get most affected are those in, in the emerging market world. And why is that the case? That's because they are not fiscally as strong. They don't have the same strong access to markets for them to be able to come up with credible guarantees. So there's a real issue here with respect to coordination. Countries will need to move uh, together when they are working on their, on their policies to heal financial sectors. And with this, uh, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jörg. In the interest of time, let's go directly to Hans for the presentation. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. So good afternoon again. Uh, uh, thank you, Uri. Uh, and <laughs> thank you, Uri. Uh, uh, I, I feel a little bit awkward because, as a guest, I uh, I almost uh, come uh, empty-handed because I basically only have one chart uh, to show to you, which is this one. And that's actually uh, a different form of the first chart that, uh, that Jörg already uh, has shown you. Uh, I have no forecast to give you uh, for reasons I will tell in, uh, in, in a moment. But I will try to, uh, to provide some, uh, some food for thought. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion, uh, actually. 
So this is a chart that uh, we at the bank are, are looking a lot at. We update it every night. It is uh, uh, world uh, industrial production uh, consisted of uh, more than 100 countries put together. And it's a very raw data because this is months over months uh, growth. And we find it always fascinating. And for you, it's probably just a cloud, but there are lots of things that you can, uh, can read in it. Uh, one way of, of reading something in it, uh, this starts in 1919 and goes to the summer of 2008, is by splicing it somewhat or do 12 months over 12 months uh, growth rate and then suddenly you see a pattern uh, emerging. You see in the early 2000, uh, the dot-com uh, uh, crisis, the, the burst of the, of the bubble. You see which is at a at an, uh, global scale not that big but in 1908, the East Asian uh, crisis uh, reflected in, uh, in those numbers. And then in the early 90s, you see the recession in high-income countries, which was not synchronized, started first in the, in the United States and then moved to, uh, uh, to Europe. Um, and what you, and that is very important for us, what you also see is that over the last 10 years, there was exceptionally strong and steady growth in the world economy. And if you look at other indicators, then you will see exactly the same pattern. Now, you can go one step further in trying to analyze this, uh, this chart, and that is looking still at that, uh, the trend line, but then split the trend line for the high-income countries, the yellow one here, and for the low- uh, and middle-income countries. And then you see that that strong growth that you saw over the, uh, uh, over the last, say, eight years, that was mainly due to very, very strong performance in the, in the developing world. There was really an acceleration throughout the developing uh, world that was not due because of what happened in the high-income countries, but was because of uh, reforms in many developing uh, regions because those regions entered international markets and uh, were able to, uh, to benefit from catching up uh, in, uh, in productivity. And this is not uh, really a China story. It's not even a China and India story. If you, see, if you take China and India out, you see even, uh, even more of an, uh, of an acceleration. So that cloud that we started with actually has a lot of information on what happened in the, uh, in the global economy. But let's go back to that cloud that I started with and then add the last six months. So this is really, really exceptional uh, what happened. We are completely off the chart. Uh, the world economy is underwater. Uh, what started in the, in the middle of September uh, as the failure of... Uh, uh, with the failure of, uh, of Lehman Brothers as a, as a financial crisis, a panic, as a result of which all kinds of uh, banks, financial institutions started uh, uh, repatriating their investments from overseas, uh, uh, drawing back a lot of capital also from, uh, from the developing world, uh, started deleveraging their, uh, their balance sheets, had immediately an uh, enormous impact on the real economy. Uh, within half a year, the world economy lost 15% of its industrial uh, production. That's only in, uh, in half a year. And what is striking is that it happened everywhere. There is no country exempted. You see in some countries it's somewhat harder, but, but almost within no time, uh, every corner of the world sees this same kind of picture. And that is not because we have a lot of trade linkages and this, ba this is basically an, uh, a U.S. problem. This is because all countries are directly hit in their domestic economy. This is because also developing countries are seeing now uh, investments uh, suddenly uh, collapsing and indeed demand for durable goods and, and cars are declining in China and in South Africa and in, uh, in India. The financial crisis has an enormous impact on, uh, uh, on the real economy. So already in, uh, in Aug uh, not in August, but in October, we wrote that uh, this was something that would hit uh, all countries in their domestic economy. Uh, we expected a contraction of world trade for 2009. Uh, earlier this year, we, uh, we wrote that uh, the world economy uh, would contract as a whole and uh, that there would be uh, lots of uh, vulnerabilities. But now we are updating those forecasts again and they will be more, uh, more pessimistic. I just came back from, uh, from the board at the, at the World Bank to discuss the different aspects uh, that are linked to this uh, phenomena and the consequences for the bank. We will have 
tomorrow in uh, another board meeting uh, on that. And at the end of the month, we will uh, give an update of our forecast for, uh, for the world economy. And that's why I cannot share the, uh, the data here with you, because we will do that together with Bob Zellick, and he has really emphasized that we cannot, uh, we should keep our ammunition uh, dry. But, but uh, what is important to note is that uh, it has so many different aspects. It is not just the fall in production, the fall in trade. You saw commodity prices uh, collapsing. It's hitting first the, uh, uh, the private sector in all kinds of, uh, in, in almost all economies. But now what we are very worried about is the problems that are arising in government sectors because the revenues of governments are collapsing at the same time. Uh, there is an attempt to, uh, to stimulate uh, the, uh, the economies. Uh, you see that the borrowing costs are going up. So very rapidly we see that the sovereign sector is, uh, is de deteriorating and also. And what we are very worried about is the, the problems on the, on the current, uh, current account, especially in Eastern Europe where there are still lots of countries where the current account deficits are uh, close to 10% of, uh, of GDP with the fall in the, in the capital flows that, uh, that creates uh, huge uh, uh, risks for, uh, for many, many countries uh, in, in the world. Uh, uh, this is the picture that uh, that we have. Uh, my my last uh, chart uh, is uh, is going uh, uh, to the countries uh, to see that uh, although all countries are affected, uh, some are affected uh, even more than uh, than others. What you're seeing here is the decline in industrial production since the summer. So you see that especially a couple of capital goods exporters, countries that are specialized in the production of in investment goods are hit very hard, very, uh, <coughs> very much in line with the, uh, the story that we told earlier uh, on already that this was a financial crisis that would uh, hit immediately the, uh, the investment uh, sector. But you see, for example, that Taiwan has lost more than 40% of its production uh, within, uh, within half a year. Uh, Japan, uh, uh, Germany is there in the, in the line. What you also see is that there are a couple of really vulnerable countries at the moment in, um, uh, in the developing uh, world, especially in, uh, in Eastern Europe, but some of them also in, uh, in Latin America, where the decline in production is especially, uh, especially hard. What I want to do, uh, since you already uh, uh, had a forecast, and I'm not allowed to give you a forecast, I, I want to pose two issues on the table uh, that I would be very much interested in, in, uh, in discussing. The first one is, uh, what, what, is what I would call the need for a long-term perspective at the moment when we are discussing policy options. In my view, too much we are discussing now policies, governments that have to go all out as if there is no tomorrow. And I think that's very dangerous for a couple of, uh, of region, uh, reasons. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason why people are talking about it like that is they say we have a crisis at the moment. It, uh, <coughs> uh, it is really a disaster. And w in a disaster, you have to rescue people. And you are not organizing meetings for uh, 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 structural reforms or structural uh, discussions. That might be, but with some of the, the policies undertaken at the moment, if they are not put into a longer term perspective, then you might create actually problems in the, in the medium run for several reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, we do think that if you look at the developing countries, that there is still this very strong underlying growth potential. That growth potential that, that was responsible for, for the very strong growth that I, I illustrated uh, uh, this decade uh, with the industrial production uh, numbers. Uh, after everything settles down and after there's a rebound and there will be a uh, rebound, even if it's uncertain when it will be, that strong, uh, that strong growth uh, can come back in developing countries. This was not a crisis that originated there. This was a crisis of, uh, of uh, financial sectors in the, uh, the high-income countries. Uh, many developing countries uh, went through a period of very strong reforms, uh, have good policy in place, and it's very dangerous now to change those policies and to create uh, a debt in the medium run that could frustrate that, uh, that growth. That is one reason. The other reason is, is perhaps even more important, and that is that one of the problems at the moment, why you see the collapse in the, in the world economy, 
is that there is complete lack of confidence in the, in the world economy. And uh, investors don't want to invest. They sit on their money. Consumers, they, uh, they want to save. And uh, one thing that you can do with your policy is try to rebuild that confidence again. And you cannot rebuild that confidence by just announcing very big programs. You only rebuild that confidence by showing people where you will be five years from now, what ultimately the, the role of those, uh, those policies is. And finally, I think that uh, the fact that there is uh, at the moment a lot of funding available to, uh, to rebuild the economy, and this is a moment really to, to decide how to spend uh, that money. And that's why you hear from the World Bank uh, many times now suggestions of, uh, of investment funds that can be invested in developing countries to address the bottlenecks that, uh, that have arisen over the last uh, decade that has, have to be addressed so that you can have stronger growth in the, in the, in the coming decades. It is very important to, to spend the money now in a productive way so that you can and support growth, that is also a way to, uh, to try to prevent huge fiscal problems in the future. So, so that, is, uh, that, that is one issue that I think is important. The second issue is about globalization. And there is a lot of fear at the moment that there is a huge backlash against globalization. Uh, throughout uh, the world, you see uh, protectionary measures. Uh, we are very much afraid that uh, this is a discussion that starts also in Africa. Uh, Africa started relatively late with reforms, but had recently also a lot of success in, uh, in opening uh, up their, uh, their economies, integrating into uh, the financial uh, markets. And now you see a backlash because they, they see the negative consequence of for the first time uh, trying to use also uh, foreign funding and private uh, funding and they try to, uh, to reverse that. So there, there is an enormous backlash but what I want to put on the table is that there might also be an opportunity actually of getting a new start of globalization, globalization and perhaps a different start with different leaders and with different uh, objectives. Because one thing that might happen as a result of this, uh, this crisis, that you see somewhat of a rotation of the forces of growth in the, in the global economy, somewhat away from uh, the United States that had a, a dominant uh, position, much more towards uh, Asia. And what might happen is that those who uh, will benefit most from further globalization, and that is many of the Asian countries will now take much more the lead than they have done over the, over the last uh, decade. So in, in sense of instead of retreating and going back to where we were during the 60s and the, and the 70s, you might actually see also a change in uh, globalizations. So those are the two elements that I want to put on the table. Want to sit here? Thank you, Heinz. Ambassador. Um, we can't underestimate the extent of the problems that the world economy is now facing. In the United States, there's been a rapid decline in household wealth and a sharp rise in unemployment. The U.S. economy shrank by 6.2% in the last quarter of last year, and in the euro area, the decline was 5.8%. One must, of course, recognize that employment levels from which these declines are taking place was at an historic all-time high. More worrying for the future is the fact that there has also been a steep fall in capacity utilization in the economy. Part of the current problem relates to toxic assets. On behalf of the European Union, I strongly welcome the measures announced by the U.S. government in recent days to deal with these assets. Using the expertise of the private sector to price these assets is wise, especially as the private sector will lose or gain depending on the wisdom of its decisions. We do not underestimate the difficulties in this process. The assets that are to be valued are inherently complex and heterogeneous, and the information available about them is inadequate. It is also important to stress that quite apart from the issue of toxic assets, the banking system probably needs significant recapitalization. In some European countries, this has been achieved by debt for equity swaps, i.e. the government puts money in uh, in return for shareholding, part or wholly nationalization, in other words. I can understand that this isn't an easy option for the United States to adopt although there are precedents for it, continental Illinois being one. But I also would agree that the political economy 
of recapitalizing banks is quite difficult, particularly in the United States. And this is because, essentially, the fact that banks are public utilities, just as like roads, uh, uh, sewage systems, electricity grids, and the like, the fact that they are public utilities has not been explained to the public by the politicians. Banks are not like automotive companies. They're not like companies producing uh, detergents. They're not like any of these products for which demand may rise or fall depending on consumer tastes. Banks, like roads and like railways, are part of the essential uh, system of public utilities without which there would be no economy. And it seems to me that the discourse about assisting banks at the moment in this country has completely ignored the public utility character of banks. And for one, as somebody who has been a politician for 35 years, I do not understand why the politicians in this country have failed to explain that banks are public utilities and why in the discussion that's taking place on these matters that those words, public utility, are not in fact being used because I think people understand. For example, the railway system in my country, uh, which was private in the 19th and early 20th century because of the difficulties experienced in the 20s and 30s, the railways were not allowed to close, they were nationalised so that we could still have a railway system which we now have the option of privatising if we want to, or not, as the case may be. But the natural thing was to ensure that those utilities stayed in being. Why isn't the same simple case that a very simple people, the Irish people in the 1930s, could be persuaded to accept at a level of sophistication much less than the current American population? Why is that case not being made about banks at this time? They are public utilities, period. I would also like to stress that I'm very supportive of the work that the administration is doing to stimulate the U.S. economy separately from the recapitalization of banks. The stimulus bill will reduce what would otherwise be a radical decline in the economy. I wish to respond to one criticism that is sometimes voiced of government stimulus of the economy in current circumstances. This is the criticism that the increased government indebtedness involved may ultimately lead to inflation, to higher interest rates, and to the problem, aggravate the problem of dealing with the consequences of aging in Western societies. While each of these are legitimate worries, the truth is that the present decline in the economy in 2009 is so rapid and radical that if it is not mitigated, by government stimulus, there will be a precipitous decline in production capacity. For example, if a mine closes, it's not easy or cheap to reopen it. If a factory closes, it's not all that easy either to reopen it. Likewise, if transport links are permanently closed down because of lack of demand, they are not, in many cases, easily reopened. Thus, if a radical downswing in production capacity occurs because of current short-term thinking, uh, short-term conditions, that could actually increase longer-term inflation and longer-term deficit worries. For example, the decline in tax revenue in an economy without stimulus could add more to government debt than the stimulus itself in the short run. Furthermore, if production capacity is shut down, there is a risk of a significant spike in inflation as soon as demand resumes, whereas if a modest modicum of production capacity is maintained, that rapid upswing in inflation is less likely to occur. I believe the essential task, therefore, facing governments today is one of smoothing out 
the otherwise radical swings in the economy that might occur so as to maintain long-term production, 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 production capacity. And I think that's how it should be presented. Stimulus is the wrong word. Stabilization would be a better word to explain what we're doing, just as public utility maintenance would be a better word to use what we're doing at the banks than rescue. And I think words make a difference. Words are what have become embedded in people's minds, and if we choose the wrong words to explain what we're doing, we shouldn't be surprised that people don't understand what we're doing. Of course, this does not mean, when I talk of maintaining production capacity, that there need be no structural change. Some of the patterns of consumption that obtained in the recent past were unsustainable and ought never to be returned to. The level of environmental degradation that arose from the artificial and unsustainable consumer-driven society, for example, in this country, funneled by, uh, fueled by borrowing and destroying the global environment, we don't want to return to that. And we should not try to do so. But the journey towards a more sustainable economic model should be undertaken in a deliberate and phased way rather than by radical shock therapy of the kind that would otherwise kill the patient, which is what we're heading for unless we have what they call stimulus. As far as the European Union is concerned, we have been providing funds to stimulate our individual national economies in accordance with the individual room for fiscal manoeuvre that each country has. We have also, in conjunction with the IMF, been providing funds to assist some EU member states and European non-members who have got into particular difficulties. We would caution also against sweeping generalizations about Central Europe. Some Central European countries have very sound positions and are enjoying more growth than many other European countries are. Finally, it is vitally important, as has been stated, that global leaders work together to resolve these problems. We support U.S. proposals to increase funds for the International Monetary Fund, and I'm sure the World Bank as well. For the credibility of our stimulus measures, it's also impo important that the causes of the current difficulties are seen to be dealt with as well. That is why European proposals, for example, for better regulation of the financial sector, are fully compatible with short-term fiscal stimulus measures. In fact, they complement one another. And I'm confident therefore, that that will be the conclusion of the G20 on the 2nd of April. There is no contradiction between U.S. ideas on stimulus and European ideas on regulation. The stimulus is more credible if it's accompanied by regulation, and the regulation is more credible if it's accompanied by stimulus. This is not some sort of a struggle between two concepts. Rather, it's a complementary, complementary situation. And to conclude, I agree very much that stimulus or stabilization is more credible if it is, dealt, if it is accompanied by dealing with longer-term issues. For example, a short-term stimulus of some of the European economies would be more, more, more credible if it was accompanied by medium to long-term decisions to increase the pension age. Stimulus of the U.S. economy would be more credible if it was accompanied by decisions in the medium to long term to reduce eligibility for Medicare and Medicaid. In each country, there are different medium to long term fiscal problems or entitlement problems, which if you deal with them in the medium to long term, but make the decisions now, that makes your stimulus in the short run more credible because people can see how you're going to pay for it in the long run. If you just have stimulus without making the long-term decisions and making them while there's a crisis on, which is the easy time to do it, rather than putting them 
into the medium future, as seems to be the pattern that's being adopted currently, where people are talking about deficit targets but not saying how they're going to achieve those targets, talking about fundamental reform but not making the decisions in the reform. I mean, talk about fundamental reform is cheap. Decisions are sometimes politically expensive, but that's what we need at this time. Let's see. This is working? Yep. Okay, well, I must say I've listened with rapt attention to uh, <clears throat> uh, my uh, uh, co-panelists. Uh, very crucial time. Uh, I'm going to make three main points um, today. One is um, uh, we need to be modest in our forecasting. Uh, right now. The second point is that it may well be that the recovery in 2010 is the most likely forecast, but I think we should consider the possibility that we will face a depression, and I will define a depression in a moment. And uh, because uh, I believe a depression scenario is a genuine possibility, um, I believe that uh, uh, the proposals currently on the table of the G20 uh, do not go far enough and that we need to use all uh, the available uh, policy space. Uh, these are my three points. Uh, let me just quickly go through them. The first point about modesty in forecasting. Um, I was forecasting a year ago with Hans, so, and I made the same mistakes. Um, so these are my mistakes uh, as much as anybody's, uh, anybody else's out there. Uh, who imagined a year ago that in 2009 the WTO would predict that world trade is going to decline by 9% this year? Who imagined that the global economy would contract? World Bank and IMF forecast. Who imagined that the U.S. budget deficit would reach 13% of GDP, that is the uh, CBO uh, projections, and so on? Who would imagine the disappearance of investment banks? And I could go on and on. Um, the basic point is that the normal standards do not apply uh, to this particular recession, and this is handsomely brought out in uh, Hans's graph here uh, on my right. Um, professors Rogoff and Reinhardt have recently summarized the experience of financial crisis, and uh, they show how uh, they last longer than normal downturns, three to four years, and how they are much more uh, violent. Uh, on the low end, they imply a peak to trough decline in GDP of 4%. On the high end, 25%. Because unemployment is rising at such a rapid rate, considerations about pent-up demand in housing and automobiles, Larry Summers made this point recently, that uh, uh, you know we need uh, uh, we need uh, 1.7 million, as I recall, housing starts to keep up with with demand. We've got 400,000, and so on. You can make similar arguments on on cars, but with unemployment rising at these rates, uh, these kinds of considerations on pent up demand uh, do not apply. I mean, at some point we're going to get a recovery, but it's very unlikely that people confronted. Uh, with a high probability of a job loss, are going to go out and buy cars and, and houses. And, of course, the effectiveness of policy is lessened greatly when uh, uncertainty is so great. Uh, fiscal policy tax cuts can be saved. I could talk more about that. Uh, monetary policy, you have Keynes's and others' liquidity trap, uh, etc. You pump money in, and it... Uh, gets saved. 
So um, uh, this is one of the reasons, I think, that uh, our forecasts have uh, uh, and our, our points of reference actually uh, are challenged completely uh, by the episode uh, that we are, we are observing. Now let me move to the second point, which is recession may still be the most likely scenario and if you push me into a dark alley and put a gun to my head and tell me what, you know, ask me what my forecast is uh, for next year, I'll still say I think this thing is going to uh, start bottoming out uh, in 2010. That's my best guess. But I have to tell you that I hold that uh, forecast uh, with a very low degree of confidence. And I want to talk a word about, uh, I want to talk a little bit about depression which I probably couldn't have done when I was working at the World Bank uh, a year ago. Uh, what is, first of all, what is a depression? Well, uh, we don't even have an accepted definition of a depression. Well, Professor Barrow has helped us recently by declaring that as far as he's concerned, a small depression is a decline of 10% of more of 10% or more of GDP, that is a peak to trough decline, occurring over uh, multiple, uh, multiple years. He has, by the way, a definition of a major depression, which is 25 uh, percent, as I recall, or was it 30 percent? Uh, I don't have the number here. I think it's 30 percent uh, decline of GDP over uh, uh, multiple years. Uh, he then concludes that when the stock market uh, declines by 25 percent or more in real terms, uh, on the basis of uh, several dozen such episodes, 30% uh, of the time you get a uh, mini depression uh, uh, that is 10% or more decline in uh, GDP. Now, of course, the stock market decline we've had to date is well over 25%. It's more like uh, 50%. And if you ask, well, take a look at the consensus forecast of uh, you know, somewhere close to the IMF and World Bank forecast or the J.P. Morgan forecast. And what is the peak to trough decline in GDP uh, implied by those forecasts? You get uh, actually for the United States, uh, for the latest J.P. Morgan forecast, which was just done in March, a 3.5% decline uh, peak to trough in uh, uh, GDP. So not even a halfway towards a... Uh, a uh, uh, minor uh, depression. And you have to say, well, are these forecasts credible given what we are watching in terms of the stock market uh, uh, collapses that we've had and the uh, absolutely frightening figures on industrial production and world trade? And uh, uh, my conclusion is that uh, uh, these forecasts must be considered to be held uh, with a low degree of confidence, and I was glad to see that my uh, IMF friend uh, showed um, uh, uh, large ranges. Uh, by the way, a 10% decline in GDP, peak to trough, would imply uh, unemployment in excess of 15% uh, in this, um, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, country. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, the depression forecast is not really widely accepted in, uh, among economists, partly because uh, everybody thinks uh, we've had the depression, we've learned all the lessons, we're doing all the right things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And by and large, that is very probably true. However, uh, the question that they need, people need to address also is: Do we are we facing the same sort of problem as we were? Uh, during the Great Depression, is this, um, are there some aggravating factors uh, in this particular uh, circumstance? And I believe there are. Um, what are these aggravating factors? Well, you know, for a start, we've got this kind of momentum. You know, when you have this kind of downward momentum in the world economy, you can pretty much assume that uh, this thing is not going to turn around. Uh, very quickly. I mean, people are still very much losing their jobs, and then other people lose their jobs, and so on and so forth. So we are, uh, uh, we are still very much in the very steep uh, part of this curve. That's a start. But 
uh, a lot of indicators are quite worrying. I mean, the size of the debt in the United States and the UK is higher than it's ever been. I mean, I'm talking the aggregate of all debts. Um, and the complexity of financial instruments is unprecedented. A lot of these financial instruments are not only complex, but very non-transparent. Uh, I can't tell you right now. We know that there are many trillions of dollars of credit default swaps uh, that are outstanding, and we know that this is sinking AIG. I don't know who else has these um, uh, credit default swaps, and if you ask the experts, uh, the financial experts, they'll say, we also don't know because because there's no clarity in this market. There was never any, uh, any kind of formal market uh, for these instruments. That's one example, but there are many others uh, that uh, I could cite. Uh, and uh, uh, the other aggravating factors, there are two other ones that I will mention. Uh, one of them is globalization. Now, Globalization gives us many good things, and I have no doubt that it accelerates the uh, long-term uh, rate of growth of the world economy. But it also makes uh, g countries much more dependent on each other. And uh, when the crisis is global, as it is now, the coordination issues that are raised are just infinitely more complex uh, than they are when you are dealing uh, with, a, with a relative small and isol with a relatively large and isolated economy, as by the way was the United States back in the 1930s. The uh, trade to GDP ratios in the United States in 1929 was only four uh, percent. And the other uh, the other issue which has been mentioned um, is uh, uh, the uh, political will uh, issue. I mean, what is very clear, and both, um, uh, both Ambassador Bruton and Jorg also mentioned this, uh, uh, the uh, bailouts that we're talking about, the remedial measures we're talking about, have significant distributional impact. And rightly or wrongly, they're viewed by the public as redistributing money from taxpayer onto uh, wealthy, Wall Street, uh, wealthy Wall Street bankers. And to a degree, they're right. <laughs> Um, uh, the political will uh, issue of uh, dealing with this problem, therefore, is a major one um, which uh, uh, I think aggravates, aggravates this problem. Okay, uh, my third and last point, I don't know how long I've been speaking, but uh, how long have I got? A few moments? Okay. Um, uh, so let me say a word then about uh, uh, the third point which is the need to use all the available policy space. I, I'm going to disagree a little bit with Hans and with Ambassador Bruton. I, um, I think that now um, uh, the situation is so dire uh, that we need to concentrate 90% of our attention onto uh, uh, fixing, you know, stopping the fire, uh, stopping this collapse here, uh, rather than... Uh, expending a lot of political capital and time, uh, which is very scarce, on uh, redesigning the system uh, for the future. And in no way do I want to suggest that this is not an important part of what needs to happen. Uh, but I just think that we've got a major, uh, major problem to deal with uh, immediately. Uh, then uh, you look at the policies and... Uh, I don't have time here to go into detail on the various policies, but I can convey to you uh, the general sense that while policymakers are doing a lot, I think they need to be doing more, and I think they can uh, be doing more. On the fiscal stimulus side, uh, I think this needs to be looked at like you're fighting a war because it's, this is the magnitude of the problem uh, that you are dealing with. Um, and when we fought wars, uh, I think the UK, if I remember correctly, came out of World War II with a 450% uh, debt to GDP ratio. Uh, United States came out of World War II with 125% uh, debt to GDP ratio. Uh, now, in 2009, according to IMF projections, 15 of the 20 in the G20 will have debt-to-GDP ratios below 80 percent, 
and uh, uh, virtually all the developing countries uh, will have debt-to-GDP ratios um, uh, below 50%. Uh, this is my way of saying, and this is after accounting, presumably, for the fiscal uh, stimulus measures uh, that uh, were contemplated at the time. Um, uh, so what I'm saying is it is possible for most of the G20, not all of them, certainly not countries like Italy, for example, uh, to uh, do quite a lot more on fiscal stimulus than we're doing, they're doing at the moment. Uh, the second point on quantitative easing, Christina Romer, current uh, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, once wrote a paper that uh, showed that uh, the emergence showed strongly suggested that uh, the emergence from the Great Depression was due to inflow of gold from Europe beginning in 1933, which led to a large expansion in the monetary supply, money supply in the United States. And that was the main factor that accounted for the turnaround um, in the U.S. economy beginning in 1933, which, by the way, was quite spectacular, of course, from disastrous levels. Uh, so I, I, I think we need to look much more carefully at quantitative easing. By and large, as uh, George has mentioned, uh, U.S., Japan, and U.K. are all moving uh, quite rapidly in this direction. I think my impression is that the EU is lacking, and I'd love to hear Ambassador Bruton on that eventually. Um, the, uh, uh, on the third point, I'm going to agree with Ambassador Bruton there on the uh, dealing with the banks. Uh, the U.S. plan, the Geithner plan, um, comes very late, uh, not because of Geithner, but because of all the complexities uh, that we've seen. It comes very late in the game. This financial crisis is one and a half years old at least, um, but uh, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, we don't know whether it's going to work. It's a very complex plan. There are many, uh, many pitfalls, I believe, in the way the plan is, uh, is structured. But I think everybody needs to move ahead along similar lines or, you know, there are many vari variations of the scheme. Um, and uh, uh, I think that we need to give this thing three months to work. And if it's not working in three months, then I think we should move to plan B which is the nationalization of those uh, institutions that are, um, uh, uh, that are most vulnerable. Um, I think the recapitalization of the IMF is likely to be the most uh, uh, concrete achievement of the uh, uh, coming G20 meeting. That's my guess uh, from what I hear. Um, uh, but we should be prepared to do even more. Uh, World Bank's assessment, uh, Hans didn't really mention it today, is that in a low-case scenario in 2009, the refinancing requirement in developing countries will be $700 billion. Uh, well, maybe the IMF needs more than $500 billion. Uh, and my last point is on protectionism. I think uh, the protectionist threat is now very real. I did not used to think that uh, even three months ago, four months ago. Uh, but basically, the intensity of the crisis is such, and uh, the extent of government involvement and the distortionary nature of the uh, various bailouts and interventions uh, is such uh, that uh, uh, even when uh, countries don't intend to protect, that is the effect of their intervention and uh, they will be interpreted to be protecting by um, their commercial uh, rivals. Furthermore, WTO disciplines, despite the uh, high billing uh, on, uh, on countries, are actually very, uh, very weak. There are all sorts of ways uh, to get around those uh, disciplines, and the sanctions uh, system is actually uh, very limited, incapable of dealing with a uh, simultaneous uh, rise in a large number of uh, disputes uh, around the world. Uh, so I think that the G20 needs to do more in this direction. There are many things. Uh, I have uh, written a short paper which uh, uh, details some of the measures. Uh, 
But one thing I would highlight, and I, will ho I hope that it comes out of the G20 meeting, is uh, to give the WTO formal authority uh, to monitor all changes in trade policy and to oblige the G20, through their agreement, to report all changes in trade policy to the WTO and give the WTO the authority to um, uh, disseminate these findings, uh, both to the General Counsel, to the G20, and to uh, the wider public. Thank you. Thank you, Uri, and thank you to all the speakers. Well, we've had a very sobering diagnosis put on the table and a number of policy responses suggested uh, and outlined. We are going to go directly into questions. I should say that Ambassador Bruton has to leave us a little bit early, so if you have a question specifically directed to him, I will uh, acknowledge those and take those questions, and we will continue on, however, with our discussion to 4 um, p.m. in general. Um, as always, please identify yourself when you get the microphone and, and then pose your question. I'd like to take two or three at a time, two or three questions, comments at a time, uh, here in the brown jacket. Uh, Judd Harriet, documentary filmmaker. Um, I was listening to Paul, uh, Paul Krugman uh, night before last and his commentary on the recent uh, plan to uh, purchase the toxic assets from the bank. His critique was basically that all this will do is simply impart some more liquidity in the market for toxic assets. It will not get to the heart of the banking problem, which is they're undercapitalized. So my question is, uh, should we wait three months or should we move aggressively parallel with the effort to uh, impart more liquidity to the market for toxic assets, move more aggressively to recapitalize the banks at the same time? Uh, yeah, Lawrence McDonald, Center for Global Development. Um, I want to thank all the panelists, and I hope Carnegie will post this terrific slide on your website so I can download it and um, have it handy. Um, Uri, I was very interested in your comment about um, a war footing, and I understand uh, that one of the historical analysis of the Great Depression is that, in fact, the stimulus provided at that time was inadequate, and it was the stimulus that came with the war, in fact, that ended the Depression. And, of course, there's the terrifying idea that if we don't avert depression, then what we get is war. And so I'm wondering if it's possible to close the loop between the two big crises threatening the planet, one of which we've discussed today and the other of which wasn't mentioned at all after I arrived, which is the climate crisis. And we know from the geophysical scientists that we're going to need massive investment in the next 10 years to avoid, avert climate catastrophe. Could we make that our war footing, and could we have leadership from both economists and our political leaders to say we have a climate crisis that requires many billions of dollars and would it be easier to mobilize that kind of stimulus or as the ambassador says stabilization by explaining that kind of threat rather than only saying we need this to pull us out of the economic slump. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter Bottelio, Johns Hopkins University, SAIS. All of you have stressed the importance of solving the banking problem as a precondition for solving the economic crisis. Solving the banking problem requires, as some of you stressed, taking the toxic assets out of the ba balance sheets of the commercial of the banks. Many of the assets, toxic assets, uh, some of in the form of credit default swaps, are not held on the balance sheets of these banks. And we don't know much about them. We don't even know how much of that particular instrument is outstanding there and how much, uh, <clears throat> who holds it. What is your view on the credit default swap issue? How can we deal with it even if we nationalize the banks? Since we don't know what's out there and it is not on any balance sheet. Um, how best to do that is a matter that you know, I'm not going to enter into, but um, debt to equity swaps seem to be the obvious way. Um, I, if, I, if I knew for sure that we could spend the money on climate change in a way that would actually reduce climate change substantially, um, yes, I'd agree with you, but many of the climate change reducing technologies are not mature. Um, and 
it could be argued that even spending money at this stage on things that are a complete waste of time could actually be a worthwhile and justifiable because of such a deficiency in demand in the economy that simply spending the money is good in, in and of itself. But I, I think the public would want to be a bit more convinced uh, that actually what you'd be spending it on would make a difference. I think the most attractive way of dealing with this is to spend on energy conservation because we do have pretty good technology on how to conserve energy. Uh, we're not so well advanced in all cases on other forms of new energy, but conserving energy in buildings and in factories and uh, on, you know, on roads and in public transport, those are all things I think we could spend on because the technology is mature. And I have to say I don't know how to deal with credit default swaps. I'm not an expert. I'm neither an expert nor a leader, um, but as we were all introduced as being one or both, but uh, <laughs> I'm neither. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I think our experts and our leaders have also indicated that they're not quite sure how to do it. Other panelists on any of these questions? Any response? Maybe just a comment on, on the Krugman comment. Um, I mean, I think no one's proposing uh, to uh, wait for three months before we start wondering about recap. As far as I understand, there are stress tests ongoing. Uh, for the U.S. banks. On that basis, uh, there will be a determination of uh, how much capital will be needed in which institutions, and, and I would expect that the administration then comes up with plans to, to address these needs. Um, so in that sense, I, I don't, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, the problem needs to be tackled on several fronts, one of which is removal of toxic assets, pricing toxic assets, and the other is recap, but something is happening on the recap front. I just have to wait for the results. Yeah, all questions actually have a, a common theme, and that is should you focus on the defense, trying to keep the system alive, uh, trying to, uh, uh, to replenish the, uh, the lack of the uh, demand, uh, trying to use additional liquidity to, uh, to, to get uh, the market working where, or should you be on the offense, given the fact that you know that it's very difficult to keep the same system alive as we had it in, uh, a year ago? And then you can see even the crisis as an opportunity that you can have uh, new initiatives uh, in, uh, in green technologies that you focus more on, uh, on climate change as you change it. Uh, I, I think it's good to go back to the early 80s and the experience in, in Europe and, uh, and other parts of, uh, of the world uh, where I think uh, the policies were too defensive and ultimately they, they paid a price. The analysis after the first and the second oil crisis was somewhat similar as the analysis at the, at the moment in the sense that we had a huge transfer of money to, uh, from oil importing to oil exporting countries. Oil exporters were, uh, were not consuming that money, so there was suddenly an enormous drop in effective demand, and everybody came to the conclusion that here you need gains and we have to spend, and we have to save the, uh, the existing industries that, uh, that suffer from a temporary fall in demand, with the idea also just to, uh, not, not to, to have uh, the destruction of, uh, of, of capital. So there was a huge spending in Europe to keep uh, the, uh, the heavy industry uh, alive, uh, to continue with the shipbuilding, not realizing that what the, uh, the crisis uh, had shown was uh, a change in uh, comparative advantage in the world that suddenly became apparent in, uh, in Europe, and that was something that w w uh, we, we were not able to save anyhow. So that created... And a huge build-up of debt in the government that created what you could say almost a lost 80s with very low uh, growth. The same happened in, the, in Latin America, uh, of course. And then at the end of the 80s, Europe lost anyhow the industries because those heavy industries went anyhow to... Uh, to the United States. So, so whether you think about uh, the toxic assets in the, in the banking system or whether you think about uh, car industries or existing industries that, uh, that have problems, it is not necessarily always the best option to try to prevent the slowdown that actually has already uh, occurred. And uh, it, it does make sense to think about the new opportunities that are out there. And, and the point that I would make is, is the one that I put on the table uh, in, in the presentation 
also, that there are at the moment in the developing countries huge opportunities of investments with a, with a big payout which can create further growth. One of the reasons that uh, especially in high income countries uh, production is falling now so sharply is that suddenly the high income countries are not exporting anymore to developing countries. Over the last couple of years, strong uh, growth was still strong in the high income countries despite the fact that there was a fall, a necessary fall in domestic demand because there was still a lot of exports of capital goods to developing countries that could use it in a, in a very productive way. That, uh, that is no longer there, and you see a uh, sharp uh, uh, reduction in, uh, in production. It does make sense to think about the new opportunities of the next decade. And if you are thinking about stimulus, not just to stimulate your own economy, but think more in a global way so that you can stimulate those countries where there's a huge growth potential, which ultimately will benefit and also your exports. Yes, uh, on the climate change, since Lawrence uh, also asked me to directly, um, uh, I mean, as I, as I suggested in my presentation, I think there is, uh, there is uh, scope for some countries to spend more than they're spending at the moment to uh, deal with the crisis as part of the stabilization, uh, stabilization policies. Um, so there may be opportunities for very, very high return investments on climate change such as and, and fairly sure investments uh, such as uh, energy conservation. But I don't think we should be left with the impression that, you know, in the middle of this financial crisis, we have a shortage of ideas on how to spend money. Uh, I was just in uh, Russia, China, and, uh, and the Middle East just before I came here. And, uh, and uh, believe me, I mean, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of issues immediately uh, requiring attention. Even in this country, uh, in yesterday's uh, press conference, uh, uh, the president indicated the issue of, you know, child, uh, chil homeless children. Um, in, in Russia, 30% uh, of, the, of the population is below the poverty line at the moment, a lot of pensioners. It said that there's a huge uh, social agenda um, that needs to be supported uh, as we go through this episode, if for no other reason, not just for moral reasons, if for no other reason than if we have 15% unemployment, we're going to have uh, uh, an explosion uh, in various places. Uh, difficult to say when and where. Um, and, uh, and last but not least, uh, I think part of the reason we've been so hesitant to move ahead on the banks is that uh, I think politically it's extraordinarily difficult to accept the cost of the bailout uh, that, uh, 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 that is implied. And uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is at the heart of the hesitancy uh, that we have seen in the course of the last year, uh, year and a half, uh, is uh, <laughs> the reluctance to say, okay, we're going to take, you know, 10% of GDP, because typically 15% of GDP, typically this is what these crisis, financial crisis costs, and uh, uh, support the banking system. Uh, so that's, you know, so I just want to convey the point that there's a lot of things that government money needs to do at the moment. We have no uh, shortage of immediate issues to deal with, although certainly uh, some aspects of climate change deserve attention. Thanks. My name is Mark Castellano with the Government Accountability Office. I have a question about the uh, one of the chief firefighters, if you will, that is the IMF. Yesterday they announced a pretty significant um, set of reforms. was curious. Um, two questions there. One is, um, does that reform represent a true departure? And number two, what does this mean in a practical sense? Uh, how will it play out, that is, in countries like Ukraine, the Latvias, uh, Romania just yesterday is starting a new program. How will we see it manifest, and is it going to help? Hi, I'm Ben Carliner from the Economic Strategy Institute. I'd like to uh, follow up on that question and raise the issue of global imbalances and specifically ask if uh, <clears throat> the lesson that many countries seem to take away from the 97 Asian financial crisis, that it's good to have 
large stocks of foreign exchange reserves as a sort of insurance policy against uh, sudden stops in capital inflows, whether that's being reinforced by the current crisis? And if so, is this a threat to the long-term economic recovery? And if it is, what should we do about it? Hi, my name is David Kane with the Mary Noel uh, Office for Global Concerns. My, my question is, like, uh, especially for the ambassador, um, a real concern of ours with the, the G20 plan is, is the, the idea that most or perhaps all of the money will be going through the IMF. And the IMF ha has a multi-decade history of, um, of conditionalities that, are, that go exactly contrary to what is needed today. I mean, even in contracts that the IMF signed, a few months ago in the middle of this, of this crisis, they continue with the same contractionary telling uh, governments to, to restrict spending, to cut uh, public services, cut health health care and things. So we're just really concerned that if the money goes through the IMF, what sort of guarantees will there, will there be that those conditionalities won't continue uh, that would sort of undermine the, the, the whole purpose of the, of the uh, stimulus? Yeah, um, Robert Kiepitz. Um, I, I'm struck by the fact that we've had four very doer views of, of uh, the outlook. In fact, really one very doer view of the outlook. And it's not clear to me why you've, uh, it, it, there seems to be an assumption that because the, um, the downturn has been exceptionally deep, it's also going to be exceptionally long. And I'm wondering what you're not seeing that that or, or what you perhaps could see that would convince you that, in fact, the world economy is going to bounce back fairly quickly. I, I think that the point that's been made by others on the platform, uh, with which I would agree, that the um, rapidity of the decline in production is so enormous that it has built up an almost a, a self-reinforcing momentum, both in the psychology of the public and in the reality of the business world. And that that momentum is likely to make the decline longer than it would otherwise be. Um, on the question about the IMF, it is important to make the point that the IMF is an intergovernmental organization, and it is governments that decide the policy of the IMF. And if governments want to change the policy of the IMF, they can change the policy of the IMF. And my sense of the discussion we're having now is that, if you like, the, un the philosophy of economics uh, that was prevalent even 12 months ago has been dumped by almost everybody. And there is now an entirely different view being taken. People who would have been horrified at the idea of deficit spending 12 months ago are now saying we can't have enough of it. Uh, and I think, therefore, your worries about the, what might have been the past approach of the IMF to conditionality, I think, are not worries that you should have, because I think the IMF is going to be guided to not to have no conditions, of course, there have to be conditions, but to have conditions that emphasize interdependence and emphasize multiplier effects and emphasize open markets, but at the same time emphasize the need to, to ensure that we don't have social collapse. So that would be my sense of it. Um, I don't know, I mean, there are people from the IMF here, but they would probably tell you better. Um, my own sense as well about the global imbalances point is, is I, I think you're, this is a, the, the, that the, the, the un, we all knew that the situation whereby Americans were spending a huge amount more than they were earning, borrowing more than they could in most likely circumstances repay, and the Chinese were saving more than they ought to be saving, and exporting more than they were consuming, that that was not going to continue forever. Now, the question was, how was it going to be brought to an end? But everybody was saying it had to end. Now we know how it's ending. <laughs> um, uh, and I think that that's why I say, you know, the idea that somehow or other we're going to get back to 2006 
is just off the charts. That can't happen because 2006 wasn't sustainable. So we do have to have some sort of a sense of what the new distribution of production and consumption uh, and of what uh, and of what in the world is going to have to be spelled out for people. And I think part of the job of the G20, in addition to all the good things that they're going to do, is to actually paint a picture of what the world might look like five years from now. Not a plan, because you know, planning is probably beyond what these people can do. They can't ordain the future. But at least to to give a sense of a scenario of what the world might look like if we do all these things, so that people will have something to work towards, a sort of a sense of go a goal. I think that's what's, what's needed, and I think that's, you know, I think that's in its essence a political task. It's not a task that economists are particularly good at. It's not a, you know, it's not a task that financiers are particularly good at. It's a political picture painting exercise, which politicians should be good at. Uh, and I, I think politicians need to have the confidence to, to you know, take this problem to themselves and say, look, we've got to persuade people that there's hope. And this is, this is I'm not just using the word hope, um, but actually showing what they're hoping for. Yes, uh, well, let me take the questions on, on the IMF. Uh, um, the first is, what we've decided yesterday, is this a true departure relative to what we've done before? And the answer to that is unequivocally yes, and in two dimensions. The first is that we've introduced the so-called flexible credit line. This is a kind of insurance mechanism. We, ha we haven't had that before. How does it work? Uh, basically, if you are a country that has uh, policies that are considered good along various dimensions, um, then you can apply for a credit line that you can draw down if and when you need it um, without any conditionality being imposed during the time when you're drawing it down. Uh, it is beforehand that we make a judgment as to whether the policies are sufficiently strong so as to warrant uh, us giving, I mean, so as to, uh, so as to, 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 to warrant them being insured by the IMF and you pay a commitment fee, you know, for getting that insurance. That's, a, that's something completely new. This is country insurance in which we are going right now. The second departure is that we are moving, uh, that we're changing conditionality. We are moving completely away from what we call structural conditionality. Uh, we'll be more focused on, we will be focused on macroeconomic conditionality. Um, that is to say, uh, these are conditions that, that, that uh, regard the macroeconomic framework, things such as credit, money growth, reserves, and stuff like this. Uh, we're moving away from structural conditionality. Um, there was a, a, a remark here that uh, we, we keep on recommending the same bad old policies and that we are advocating, uh, you know, that we are in that, that context also with specific programs now. Um, pushing for health care cuts. Uh, I think there's an issue of information here. We are not pushing health care cuts anywhere on the country. I know in the Latvia program there's an explicit recognition that health care expansion is supposed to be protected. Social expenditure is supposed to be protected everywhere. And as I've just uh, now um, made quite clear here, um, we are supporting fiscal stimulus. In fact, as Mr. Uh, Ambassador John Bruton probably knows, I I've been working on the European uh, on, on the euro area consultations, and we've always been asking for, 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 uh, for stronger fiscal adjustment during good times, and there's a reason why we're doing, we, we've been asking this, so that you have the buffers to use them up in bad times. Uh, and, and that's what we are pushing for now. Now, the problem with many emerging market countries is that for them, uh, the ability to, to, uh, to use fiscal policy in bad times is limited because their capital market access is heavily constrained, right? Uh, so where we can step in and with our funding permit some loosening of, of policies, we do so. But in some areas, it's just not possible because they don't have access to capital markets. Um, there was not a question here on, on global imbalances. What will happen to global imbalances in the future? I think self-insurance, which is what has motivated the accumulation of reserves and has contributed, it's been one important factor behind these global imbalances, is the key issue here. Um, with our flexible credit lines, we're offering an insurance mechanism. Are countries going to go for this, or are they continuing to self-insure? Very hard to tell. Very hard to tell. I mean, it depends how successful we are in removing the stigma uh, associated with IMF, uh, with, uh, with tapping IMF funds. I mean, we're trying our best on that front. Um, 
uh, as you say, you know, uh, access to the FCL um, is a mark of distinction, uh, and, and so we hope that, that this will attract countries and, and therefore reduce self-insurance in the future. But uh, the jury on that is, is out. Um, finally, there was a question, why are we going to come back so quickly from the slowdown? Well, if uh, the projections uh, pan out the way, we have, uh, the way we are seeing it, it's actually not a quick comeback. It's actually a pretty long recession. You could still question, well, why are we coming out uh, you know, so strongly as we are forecasting? Aren't the risks on the downside? And I've already said, yes, they are on the downside. But we shouldn't, bear mar shouldn't forget that policies in many advanced economies are now highly stimulative. And that should help us uh, get out of... Uh, uh, out, out of the recession, and that the, 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 the moves on the financial sector you know, are, in, it, are encouraging. I mean, there's more to be done, but uh, they are encouraging. They are, the, the policies are becoming more specific. And finally, if you follow the U.S. housing market, uh, their defaults in prices are increasingly decelerating, uh, and you know, I think there is a good chance that by the end of this year or early next year, there's a bottoming out in that market, and that should help provide support to all these financial instruments that are causing the troubles on bank balance sheets. So on the whole, I think there are reasons to believe that we get out of this in, in, in 2010, but uh, still, I would agree that the risks are on the downside relative to the projections that we have. Uh, let me also respond to that last question about the bounce back. Uh, my answer is no, we are not uh, expecting that it will take long to bounce back because the fall is deep. Uh, but uh, there is a high probability that it takes long because it started with a financial crisis. And as the IMF showed with a couple of papers, that every recession that starts with a financial crisis takes also <laughs> longer. But we are actually looking at all kinds of signs trying to see when the bounce back uh, could come. Uh, yesterday and the day before was, uh, was positive news on the housing uh, market. If you, if you follow the uh, commodity markets, then you see some stabilization and even uh, a bounce back. And then, of course, there is uh, a lot of stimulus in the, in the system. But the point that I would want to make, that even if you uh, return to positive growth, uh, say, uh, in 2010, then still you will have the problems that are generating by this, uh, this big fall uh, with you. And those problems will be probably with you also in 2011. Because you don't need just going back to, uh, to positive growth. You need a period of growth above the historical average just to undo the gap that has been generated by the fall uh, now. Uh, we, we are uh, now far below uh, what you could call full employment uh, equilibrium, and it's not enough to just have normal growth again. You need really uh, growth, uh, both potential for quite some time, to get rid of the problem that, uh, that has been generated now. And that's why this is so depressing. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, <clears throat> I just want to come back to one of the points. Uh, on the, um, uh, what, what would we look for for the pickup? Uh, one of the reasons, I, I, I think we're all gloomy, but maybe I was a little gloomier uh, than the others, uh, perhaps because I dared to use the depression word, which is difficult to do when you're in an official capacity. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, the complication now compared to a lot of the financial crisis that are part of the sample in the slides that were shown, is that you have a collapse of world trade. I mean, in, in, uh, in the financial crisis sample, there are dozens and dozens of these financial crises, Joel, correct me if I'm wrong, that occur against the background of, uh, you know, relative normalcy in uh, uh, world trade, not necessarily a boom, but... Uh, uh, not a bust uh, either. Um, so uh, uh, so the, the, the standard way of getting out of financial crisis has happened many times in emerging markets over the last 30, 40 years, you know, big devaluation, uh, et cetera, some fiscal adjustment to give confidence to the markets, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, and uh, reduce the current account. Uh, deficit, uh, all of this uh, uh, doesn't really work in this case uh, because there's no traction uh, from the global system. Um, and uh, that is one of the reasons that I think we are, unfortunately, uh, into a, a deeper, longer episode than uh, a lot of people suspect. 
the uh, uh, what I would look for uh, in terms of turnaround, yes, I could say uh, you know I'm 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 going to look at the symptoms, uh, you know the cardiogram, etc. Uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera, you know the, the commodity prices and the housing prices, uh, etc. To signal uh, the change in conditions, but I I really. Uh, Uh, I'm going to mistrust those short-term indicators uh, until I see um, uh, uh, until I see improvement in the fundamental cause of the problem, and the fundamental cause of the problem is the uh, collapse, or not collapse, but the tremendous uh, strain in the credit system uh, around the world. Uh, so when I see a really aggressive and effective action on the banks. Um, uh, then I will f begin to feel comfortable that we're beginning to turn the corner. Uh, so far, I haven't seen that. How much, of the, how much of the credit default swaps are housing related? And if the housing market here is going to recover, you know, how good a sign is that for the resolution of these problems? I really have no idea uh, how big uh, the, the, the housing is relative to uh, credit default swaps on emerging markets, credit default swaps on uh, companies. I mean, these credit default swaps now are applied uh, to just about every financial instrument, and maybe Jorg has a better answer. I, I do suspect that it's a, it's a significant number uh, just because of the importance of the uh, – Uh, mortgages in the uh, in the portfolios around the world, and I and I I would agree that uh, improvement in housing prices uh, is is an important element of uh, of that uh, uh, is a is a significant element, but uh, it is only one part of the more complex picture. And just to add, I think that not knowing what is in the various credit default swaps is precisely one of the problems in trying to, to deal with the, the toxic assets. We have time for one more round of questions, if there are any remaining questions in the audience. Yes. I had a question for Ambassador Bruton. He stressed so much the public utility nature of banks. What should be done to get banks to behave as such? Do you think nationalization would help? I, I don't think nationalization uh, in and of itself is desirable at all um, because it creates all these problems that you know, public choice theory economics uh, has told us about people acting to, uh, in their own interests under the guise of the public interest um, but, and also distortions of good banking practice by political uh, considerations. Um, I, 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 th I think that uh, the key, t and I'm really, I'm really not an expert on this subject, um, even less than on some of the other things I've expatiated about, but um, I think that what has been missing in the banking system is um, any sort of human link between the people who are making decisions about credit and the people who are receiving the credit. Knowledge cannot all be you know, acquired from books, of, you know, from lists of figures and calculations. We, we understand people, uh, and there's all sorts of parts of our intuitive uh, equipment that enables us to see somebody on the other side of the table and have a sense that this person will repay or won't repay. And that personal element, I think, has been slowly, over many years, um, removed from the banking system. And I, I think that trying to, you know, finding a way where, where that is reintroduced to a greater extent would be helpful. But I, I've, I've no doubt that that's not the most important thing. I'm sure there are lots more important things that others here could suggest.
Glenn Rogers with USAID. You've talked a lot about some of the indicators in a, from an economic sense, but on the political economy, what would be the indicator of bottoming or turning the, the corner on the threats of protectionism or some of the other political economy threats that you've mentioned? Uh, Thibaut Delour, I come from France, so sorry about my poor English. Um, I, I'm working for the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, my question was about inequalities as a factor of, of the current crisis with, uh, on the lower side of the, the social scale, uh, very low salaries, uh, creating a huge demand for credit, and on the other side of the social scale, uh, lots of corporate profits, uh, which eventually uh, create a huge supply of credit. Uh, do, do you think that could have had a role in the current crisis? Let's see, I didn't expect you to start with me. The, uh, uh, what was the first question? I, c I can't remember the first question. Political economy indicators. Time what would be the political around. economy indicators? Yeah, no, the most important, uh, uh, the most important thing that uh, I think uh, would reduce protectionist pressure is a quick recovery. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I really, I, you know, you can think of a number of things that you can do to mitigate the problem. But in a situation where uh, the fundamentals are of collapsing activity, rising unemployment, and increased government interventions with bailouts in specific sectors that are subject to international competition, this is like, you know, this is a very bad mixture, very bad. And since there's no alternative to government intervention in the current context, uh, the only thing that will radically change the political dynamic is if we get a recovery. Uh, and that's why the policies of recovery uh, and quick recovery are uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely fundamental. Uh, the question in inequality is a very interesting question, a very deep question, one that therefore cautiously I will avoid answering at this point. <laughs> I, I would agree that under the current circumstances, you can only expect more protectionary uh, uh, calls to, uh, to come about, not only in trade, but also in the bailout programs uh, that, uh, that the population wants to focus more and more on their domestic economies. Uh, and when they realize how much is going actually to other countries, that uh, that, that creates those tendencies. But let me, uh, let me uh, point at one positive element. Uh, and that is you do see uh, more international cooperation than we used to have. The fact that we are all talking about the G20 at the moment, uh, and uh, even if not a lot of hard measures are coming out there, still we think it very important. G20 is different from G7 or G8. And, and more and more you see that uh, some of the emerging big economies are getting a uh, bigger voice in, uh, in, in those international discussions. And I think that's ultimately very important for the solution. I, I, I think it's possible to argue uh, uh, that inequality has been significantly reduced by the recession. Uh, I, I think it's likely that the biggest proportionate losses have been taken at least in the initial part of the downturn, by people with very large holdings of wealth who have seen that wealth you know, reduced dramatically in, in its value. Now, I know that as, as unemployment starts to spread, there uh, it's possible that you know, that will increase inequality because it's possible that those who lose their jobs will be people who will would be suddenly find themselves much, much poorer. But in its initial manifestation, I think that it's, it's arguable, and I've certainly read people arguing this, that it, it actually reduced inequality. Now, what are the reasons for inequality in society? I think they are, are partly to do with the uh, obsession with short-term returns, the, uh, in, in, in the way that um, 
the stock market demands uh, star performances from star individuals, and if a company is losing some star manager, that immediately has an effect on its share price, and the shareholders are demanding short-term maintenance of share price value rather than looking at the long-term interests of the company. I think it's that it's though that sort of thing that's driving inequality, plus. Um, the celebrity effect, you know, the biggest driver of inequality possibly is, you know, the, the television and people becoming celebrities and they're being able to command these phenomenal salaries because simply of their celebrity, which also affects business in some ways. Now, I don't know how we can deal with that. I mean, how do you, you turn off all televisions and say that you're not going to allow people to become famous? Um, I don't know. Yeah, just on the inequality part, I mean, I think you're also alluding to some, uh, something very important, which is the consumer protection dimension of, of the crisis that has hit. I mean, people have been sold uh, instruments or credits that uh, shouldn't have been sold to them. And so there is a consumer protection issue here, a big one, and uh, I think there, there are uh, efforts on the way to try and address these, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, also a good wake-up call for policymakers that this is a very important dimension that we should neglect as we reform uh, the financial system. Um, let me ask you to join.